Vamos começar pela, pela Agenda 2020, pelos desafios uh, internacionais que se colocam nesta altura sobre o planeta. Uh, e estou só a fazer aqui uma, um, uma apresentação muito sumária do que é que vai acontecer agora nos próximos dois ou três capítulos. Depois do debate aqui, vamos dividir-nos. No, no Teatro Camões, onde nos encontramos, vão ter lugar as conversas do oceano, as Ocean Talks. São cinco oradores, dez minutos cada um, uma hora de partilha sobre uh, temas que têm em comum o oceano e Portugal. Uh, e, uh, ao mesmo tempo, vai decorrer no passeio do Neptuno, que é o que fica aqui a bordejar o Mar da Palha, mesmo junto à entrada do Teatro Camões, vão decorrer as conversas do planeta, aquelas mesas de cimento uh, com azulejo que estão ali, vão receber cada uma um de cerca de duas dezenas de convidados da Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos e da Fundação Oceano Azul para uh, receberem e conversarem cara a cara com quem se quiser sentar nessas mesas, uh, livremente, sobre as alterações climáticas, sobre a reinvenção da gastronomia em função das preocupações que temos com o meio ambiente. Há uma série de políticos, pensadores, especialistas de várias áreas, a sugestão é que as pessoas consultem que sugiro que consultem o, o programa porque têm uma informação uh, com algum detalhe e podem avaliar o que é que pode ser interessante acompanhar e depois aproximarem-se da mesa e deixarem-se levar pela conversa e pelo ambiente e estarem o tempo que uh, entenderem. E depois teremos a sessão final deste encontro com o antigo secretário de Estado dos Estados Unidos, John Kerry, e a bióloga marinha, a Sylvia Earle. Avanço então para o desafio 2020. Vai ser um debate, que vai ter lugar agora aqui, com Carlos Duarte, ele é autor e professor de ciência marinha na Universidade do Rei Abdullah, na Arábia Saudita. Liderou uma investigação em 2010 para avaliar o estado de saúde dos oceanos. É também convidada Karen Sack, fundadora, juntamente com o empresário Richard Branson e com o ex-presidente da Costa Rica, José Maria Figueres. Ela, estas três pessoas são cofundadoras de uma organização chamada Oceans Unite, que procura melhorar a saúde e a resiliência dos oceanos, dos ambientes aquáticos, através do envolvimento direto, neste caso, de governos e de empresas. O percurso de vida da Karen Sack é todo ele uh, relacionado com o mar. Vão participar também neste debate o explorador Paul Rose, que ouvimos ontem uh, à noite, uh, a falar sobre a expedição que desenvolveu nos, nos Açores e cujos resultados científicos estão prestes a ser divulgados. E Tiago Pitei Cunha, presidente da Comissão Executiva da Fundação Oceano Azul. São então estes os desafios 2020. Thank you. Good to see you. Where do we go? Olá a todos, bom dia novamente. Muito obrigado uh, por voltarem hoje. Um, este painel sobre a Agenda Internacional dos Oceanos vai ser conduzido em inglês. Uh, Peço-vos uh, desculpa por esse facto. Uh, vamos ter um período também de perguntas e respostas para as quais eu diria que, uh, que quem conseguir fazer a pergunta em inglês seria o ideal, quem não conseguir, obviamente, eu procurarei fazer a tradução da pergunta para os membros do nosso painel. Uh, and I will switch to English now. Um, well, we have a great panel this afternoon on the international agenda. I will make a very short intro, introduction, and uh, I will uh, again uh, present uh, our panelists. So, uh, on telegraphic terms, uh, we've seen and understood yesterday uh, the ocean problems are concrete and real. The planet problems are also very real. Uh, we need to do something about it. Uh, and I would like to tell you that there is an agenda. Uh, 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 the UN has an agenda, but of course the oceans have not been on the top of that agenda. Uh, I started working at the United Nations in the 90s, 
And at that time, the forests were in the top. There was new technology that was released, satellite technology, that allowed us to see deforestation in countries like Brazil and Indonesia, and therefore the international community was seized of the forests. There was a popular opinion movement for the forests at that time. Everyone remembers Bono from the U2 and Sting, <laughs> uh, with the indigenous chiefs uh, fighting for the, for the forest struggle. Climate change was an issue for scientists in the 90s, and until Kyoto in 98 was uh, very much a complex technical issue. Nowadays, climate change, of course, sky rocked, and today we speak on a climate crisis indeed, and it's a very important political issue for the international community. Uh, and it has been so since the Paris Agreement of uh, 2015. Uh, so, what can we do so that the oceans come up more to the top of the agenda as well? That's one good question. I have to say that the first decades of this century have very much been two lost decades. The oceans have not really been in the great deals that the international community came about. To give you an example, in the Paris Agreement, for climate change, and there is nothing so <coughs> linked with climate change as the oceans. The oceans only appear with the word ocean in the preamble of the Paris Agreement. Well, and what's the agenda? Next week we have the Climate Summit of Heads of State and Government, organized by the UN Secretary General, the former Portuguese Prime Minister António Guterres. We hope is a very important step in order to prepare 2020 because in 2015, the Paris Agreement foresee that in 2020, member states need to revisit their national determined contributions, their commitments to reduce carbonization of the planet. Next week, we also have the IPCC report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Scientists for Climate Change on Oceans and Cryosphere. It's the first time in 20 years the IPCC will pronounce itself about the oceans. It's going to be a very important moment. I'm afraid that we'll also have to listen uh, to uh, not so good news because the ocean status, as we all know, is not the best. Uh, next month, we have the Our Ocean Conference in Oslo, in Norway. It's a conference that was organized by uh, former State Secretary John Kerry, who is going to be with us today, and uh, who tries to um, gather leadership from uh, uh, business communities, uh, academia, and the political uh, spheres, uh, also to push for an agenda of the international community for oceans, an agenda for oceans. And next year, of course, we have the UN 2020 Ocean Conference here in Lisbon. So there is an agenda. And um, for this panel, I'm going to ask two main questions. The first question is, what needs to be done in terms of an international agenda for um, the ocean problems? Um, on an ideal world, uh, what should be done? Um, do we need to uh, uh, rethink international governance? Do we need to have a UN body for the oceans? Uh, do we need to have an UN body for planet sustainability? Um, these are the kind of questions that you could uh, answer. Second question is going to be a bit more realistic. It's going to be, you are all very experienced. <laughs> How can, what can we do? What is feasible? Mm -hmm. What is the state of the art of the international agenda in the international community? Uh, well, and now I'm going to introduce you very briefly. We have a dream team here, like Carlos said yesterday. <laughs> Carlos was already introduced by José Alberto. Uh, he is just one of the top scientists in the world. He ranks within the 1,000 top scientists within 7 million scientists and is the number one marine biologist of that international list. He has more than 700 publications, scientific publications. He has been focused on oceans and climate change. He studies from microbes to whales in every ocean. But he also is now very much focusing his efforts on how to rebound marine life, how to recover biomass for the oceans. Karen, Karen Sack, She's been for 25 years working with NGOs. So she has been a woman of the movements for environmental sustainability. <laughs> she worked, she's of South African origin, and by the way, Carlos is of Portuguese origin. Mm -hmm. Car Karen, she's worked um, 
she worked uh, on the protection of marine biodiversity uh, in Greenpeace, uh, in their political and business unit for the ocean program of Greenpeace. She was senior director at the Pew Charitable Trust, which is a very important uh, entity in the United States uh, on environmental uh, programs. Uh, and she did an amazing thing. Uh, she found, founded in 2015 uh, Oceans Unite, with uh, Sir Richard Branson, which you probably know from Virgin, uh, and uh, with uh, Jose Maria Figueres, who is a former prime minister of uh, Costa Rica. And they did it because I think they know the clock is ticking and we need to have the leadership, to seize the leadership of the business and the political communities around an ocean agenda. So she couldn't be better for us to, uh, uh, to have in the panel. Right. And, uh, and at last but not least, of course, Paul Rose, he doesn't need any introduction. You already know him. You listened to him yesterday. He was uh, with Emmanuel Gonçalves of Fundação Oceano Azul, the face of the expedition to the Azores last year. And he is, I would say, he's one of the last explorers of this planet. Uh, there's not much to be found, but he has the name in a mountain in Antarctica. So he's an explorer, he's a diver, but he is also, as you have seen, an amazing communicator. So. Um, he's going also to be an important member of our crew. Thank you. Um, so without further ado, I would give the floor to Carlos. Carlos, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diego. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, share this debate with my colleagues and, and yourselves. And I'd like to uh, uh, take it where Diego started, with the, which is uh, what the conversation has been over the past 30 years and how we need to change the conversation to actually have a bright future for, for the oceans. And uh, in the 1990s, 92 and 93, then there was a raising awareness that uh, uh, we were losing biodiversity at alarming rates, both in terms of species and habitats. We had evidence that uh, use of fossil fuels and other human activities were impacting the climate system. And uh, also, uh, we were uh, aware that our way of doing business was not good for the environment and ourselves. So three UN conventions were uh, adopted. In 1992, there were the UN Rio Conference on Sustainable Development. So sustainable development was embraced as a paradigm. And then uh, the UN um, uh, uh, Framework uh, Climate Change Convention was uh, adopted in 92, And in 93, the, con the Convention for, for Biological Diversity. And those have been the pillars of the conversation until now. So we've been talking about sustaining and conserving the resources of the planet for about 30 years. And every year we've been talking about this, we've been losing about 2 to 3% of global biodiversity and global habitats. So every year that elapsed in this conversation, what was left to sustain and conserve was less and less and less. And by now we are left with only half of the blue natural capital and the green natural capital that our fathers encountered in the planet when they were mm. starting those conversations. So in my opinion, we have arrived to that conversation through a planetary crisis, which is a crisis of ocean, a, a crisis of climate, and a crisis of biodiversity. And we are at the verge of collapse or a threshold where it will be impossible to go back. So we cannot any longer accept the conversation of sustaining and conserving. We have to do more. We have to change the, conservation, the conversation towards rebuilding what was lost. So I would like the agenda, the international agenda, to shift gears and start talking about rebuilding marine life, rebuilding our planet atmosphere, and rebuilding our forests and our oceans. And I believe this is possible, but I will hold on the actions that may uh, render this possible for the second round of questions. But that uh, changing the conversation requires an audience. And the audience can no, no longer be only the nations. It can no longer be governments. It needs to embrace the civil society. And that con conversation should not be about the risks, perils, and dangers, and fear of what may happen if we don't change the course. The conservation, the conversation should be about the positive, should be about what benefits society at large will derive from a healthy ocean, a healthy planet, and a well-managed atmosphere. Thank you. That's great, Carl. Thank you very much. And uh, especially also finishing up with this uh, connection to civil society and what, uh, what is really important for our civil societies. And Karen, I would also ask you the same question. Thanks, Tiago. And thank you, everyone. It's lovely to be here. 
um, one of my favorite cities, and uh, <laughs> talking about the ocean and how important it is for us to move forward uh, in rebuilding uh, marine life there. So the state of the ocean, and, and I'm going to go into a few facts and figures um, just to remind us a little bit, but the state of the ocean, if we were asked how is the state of the ocean, the answer is it's not very good at all, and that's putting it mildly. There are a lot of figures that have to do with the state of the ocean that involve 90%. 90% of the big fish are gone. We have killed and eaten them or thrown them overboard dead. The tunas, the sharks, the billfish. 90%, over 90%, in fact, of the heat from our CO2 emissions have gone into the ocean and been captured by it. And if it weren't for the ocean, it would be 36 degrees Celsius warmer on land than it is right now. And the result in the ocean is we're having things like ocean heat waves. At the moment in the Pacific, there's a, a blob of heat coursing across the Pacific, and the impacts are unknown. We're seeing a decrease in oxygen contact, uh, content, and given the ocean provides every second breath that we take, that's something every single one of us needs to be concerned about. We're seeing smaller fish because when there's less oxygen, the fish actually can't grow as big. And the fish are moving because of the warmth and the temperature. They're moving uh, towards, away from the equator towards the poles. And that has huge implications for food security, for the communities that are dependent on fish in developing countries. And if we add in that about 30% of uh, the CO2 uh, has been captured by the ocean, so it's the biggest carbon sink on Earth, and that's impacting ocean chemistry. So we talk about corals and other sea creatures with shells having the equivalent of osteoporosis. They, th their shells are beginning to, to become more fragile. It's predicted under a best-case scenario of climate change, that we will lose pretty much all of the world's corals by 2050. This is staggering information. Uh, I'm, uh, I apologize for hitting you straight after lunch with all of these depressing facts. And then we've also got sea level rise as the poles melt, um, and we've seen that certainly the birth of a new ocean in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, which folks often don't think about, the rate of sea ice melt has tripled in the past five years. So that has huge implications around the world for rising sea levels. And then, if you think that's not bad enough, let's add in some pollution. Throw some pollution into the, the stew we're creating. So about 80, um, 8 million tons of plastic going into the ocean every year. It's estimated that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So that in English, there's a saying, there's always more fish in the sea. <laughs> we'll have to stop saying that. We're also seeing sewage. Uh, as more, as there are more and more people on land, not enough uh, infrastructure being created. We're seeing sewage flow into the ocean, as well as nutrients from industrial agriculture. And that's having impacts in coastal areas with dead zones um, as these areas become completely full of, uh, of toxic materials and algal blooms. At the same time, just going back to the 90%, 90% of the world's trade is carried across the ocean. We can continue to trade across a dead ocean, but we can't really continue to survive as a species and for all the other species on this planet, if there's a dead ocean. So what do we need to do? Now that I've completely depressed you, there are things that we can do. And, and if we could wave a magic wand and say that this was a perfect world, and politicians were up to the job, and business leaders, and civil society, we were all working together, I think there are three key things that need to happen in the ocean space. The first, we have got to get to net zero emissions by 2030. A lot of people talk about 2050, 
and I'm sure Carlos can talk more about what's going on with climate change, we've got no time to lose. The biggest pollutant in the ocean now, the monster pollutant, is carbon dioxide. And we've got to do everything we can to reduce the uptake of CO2 in the ocean. The second thing we really need to do is set ourselves on a path towards protecting half of the Earth by 2050. And by 2030, we need to be at a place where at least 30% of the ocean and land are protected. Right now, we're at about 3% of the ocean fully protected in what would be uh, national parks at sea. Uh, around 7% is protected in some way. But we've got to up that goal, and we've got to move as quickly as possible to get there. And that's because nature is really the most important arrow we have in our quiver to, to drive change. Nature and all of its diversity, it's like if we were thinking about investing for our retirement. Instead of investing in just one stock, we would invest in a mutual fund. We would diversify our portfolio. And that's the same thing. We need as much diversity as possible so that we can withstand the equivalent of stock market shocks that are impacting on nature and our environment. Karen, thank you very much. With that analogy, I would probably now pass the ball to Paul and you'll come back. Yes. And um, love to hear as well what Paul has to say about what needs to be done, Paul. Great, thank you. The, the biggest thing we need to do, and one of our, our biggest problem at the moment, is one of the change in values. I believe that you know we've got political leaders and political systems that don't have the values that we discuss here. We've, we've got answers, you know, I mean, all the science that's done, all of the conservation efforts, all of the work that is done throughout the world. And through my lifetime, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, who's ever seen such awareness? Who's ever seen such levels of understanding? You can't travel to any country or any school or any education system or engaged individuals or communities without them understanding everything that we're saying here. But when we move up into politics, the politi political groups seem to have strongly entrenched in to the Trump-Bolsonaro era that we live in today, where they have no values on, on this. And we're still in that age-old thing where it's up to everybody here and all right-minded individuals to provide... With, the burden of proof is on us. We have to somehow, through NGOs, and through financial support and all of the hard work and technical ability and geniuses that are, that are here in organizations just like this, to convince enormous political systems that are not up for changing anyway. And I think this is the biggest problem. I mean, how do we change those values? Well, one, I gave a talk in um, uh, the European Parliament, Brussels, a few years ago, and I suggested, I proposed that every single school in Europe had scuba diving in the curriculum. <laughs> because then I thought at least, it, well, firstly, scuba diving is the best way to learn about anything. If you want to learn about mathematics or physics or anything, you need to go diving. Mm -hmm. But it was my way of saying we need to get influencers in the front line so that when our political influencers look at forests or they look at oceans or overfishing, they feel it and mean it. I mean, how many of us, when we were young and with our families and loved ones, went through... Uh, country parks and city parks and beautiful urban walks. Mm. Pretty much everybody did that. And there's a certain number of us that will have been to sea, uh, fishing or diving or sailing, and we would have had these experiences in nature. Um, but what we've got now is we've got political groups and political classes and you know business leaders and board members and political influencers who don't have that connection to nature. They just don't have it, or if it's happened when they were young, they've ignored it. And so we've got this crazy business where all of our, the work that we do comes up into political influence. And yet, as hard as we work, it's very difficult for us to have the punch to get through it. Now, fortunately, with Oceana Azul, all the work that, that has gone on with everybody, we can do it. But it feels to me that we need a change in values. And that change in values would be that we would just assume that when we come to vote, and if we've got voting cards, or if we're on electronic voting, we would see our candidate's values. So it would say, this person, and what's she done? Ah, she has, she's an artist, she's contributed to humanities, social work, 
science, you name it, discoveries, exploration, and you'd go, ah, that's their values. And then way down at the bottom of the list will be all the classic things. You know, what political party are they in? What are their values? And also, no one would consider anybody that was, say, a, you know, a career politician or someone whose parents happen to have stacks of money and influence. You would take these values first, absolutely. And when we go buy insurance or mortgages um, or make investments, we would look and we would go with the company that was invested in natural capital. There would be no doubt about that. And we would avoid the others. And when it came to that voting machine, and you went on the vote and you realized, oh, I think she looks great, there'd be a red flashing banner that said, caution, alert, danger. The person you're about to vote for has never attended a conference like this, <laughs> has never contributed anything to the planet positively, has never become a scuba diver or a fisher person or a sailor. This is a, you can still vote for her, but guess what? She hasn't got those values. That's the sort of dream I have, so I think, we're in, we should be looking for a change in values. That's my dream. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's the ethics. Uh, <laughs> it's the ethics, stupid. Um, Carlos, um, I'm, uh, I'm very um, seduced by this idea. I think it's a very powerful idea that more than conservation, we need rebuilding. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we, Oceano Zul Foundation is a foundation for ocean conservation. We use the word conservation as the word that traditionally has been used for um, the efforts to protect uh, nature, to protect the environment. But you say that this is not enough. Can you explain a bit further mm. on how can we make this shift? How can we be more ambitious? Because what, what's there, we always say we need to save what's left. You say that that's not enough anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we do this in, in practical terms and in political terms? Mm -hmm. What would this take? Uh, a, a treaty? Uh, is this something that is already under any tr existing uh, body of law? Mm -hmm. What would you...? Yeah, so uh, I started with 1990s and the conventions that uh, were supposed to address the problems of the planet and how we lost 50% of the blue natural capital or the abundance of life in the ocean and diversity of life in the ocean since then until now. Uh, in those 30 years, we have also added 2 billion people to the planet, and we are about to add 2 billion people more by 2050. So the demands for ocean products are increasing, and yet we have a sh shrinking capital of uh, life in the ocean to support those demands. So we cannot be content with just uh, maintaining what is left, but we need to rebuild. And uh, uh, current uh, uh, number, uh, a series of facts about the oceans that are very compelling in terms of the risks and dangers to the oceans. And those facts are mm, largely correct, but if you uh, carefully observe the trends in the oceans, then you can also see emerging a positive narrative that is actually happening, happening behind uh, ourselves. But this uh, positive uh, narrative is actually hidden by the negative uh, prospects of the losses that we're experiencing, so we are not capitalizing enough on the positives. So uh, smaller conventions than the UN CBD or UN Framework Climate Convention or the Rio Sustainability Convention have actually had a very positive impact on marine life. And those are the Convention for the Trade of Endangered Species, which is called CITES. And CITES was adopted in the late 70s. And since many species that were at the edge of extinction have actually made a rebound in the ocean. So in 1970s, just before this convention was adopted, the number of humpback whales in the ocean was down to about 400 globally. Now the number of humpback whales in the oceans 30 years later is close to 50,000, and it's actually above baseline. And that's a very large animal with a very slow uh, growth rate. And we have recovered the, the humpback whale. And it, it is not alone. We have also recovered the northern elephant seal that was down, uh, down to 20 animals left in the ocean, about one ton animals, very large uh, pinnipeds. And from those 20 animals left in the end of the 19th century, we now have 200,000 animals, again above baseline. We have also recovered sea otters. We have recovered, in the process of recovering blue whales in the Pacific, and large animals are making a comeback. And that's because the ocean is hugely resilient. Mm -hmm. 
So we're making uh, gains with some of these conventions of the International Whaling Commission, the CITES Convention, and also MARPOL, which is another hidden convention that uh, rules, uh, regulates pollution in the ocean, has made also major contributions. So uh, the number of oil spills from oil tankers in the last decade has been 10 times less than the decade before. And the prospect for the future is that they will become even less uh, uh, frequent in the ocean because of requirements for double haul in uh, oil tankers. So we're actually almost done with uh, oil spills from oil tankers. And for those of us who uh, were studying biology in the 70s and 80s where we had major, major, major accidents in the world, that's really big news, but it's not celebrated enough. And I sailed the oceans with a circumnavigation expedition between 2010 and 2011, and we actually found a much healthier ocean than the numbers that you can read in the media portray. And one of the discoveries we made is that in the 1980s, uh, unleaded fuel had been introduced uh, for cars because of concerns of the impact of lead on human health. But by that, by that time, also the oceans were polluted with lead. And in 2010, about uh, 20 to 30 years after the transition from leaded to, unle to unleaded gasoline, the levels of lead in the oceans were back to baseline. And we had fixed the problem of lead pollution in the global ocean. So that's not a small thing. So we can actually uh, uh, enable change in the ocean. And the ocean has a remarkable capacity to, to uh, regrow and is very resilient. So we have made a, a literature review of all of the evidence for recovery rates in marine life and habitats. And as a rule of thumb, most marine organisms and habitats can recover within 20 years from the time that we release pressures. And we know how to release the pressures. We, know, we now know how to protect the species. We now know how to protect space, uh, spaces. We know, now know how to harvest more wisely to have less impact on uh, fish stocks and dr drive, uh, uh, drive them to sustainability. And we also know how to uh, combat pollution in the ocean. Carlos, and I, 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 yeah. I was going to, um, I was going to um, ask you to keep on this very positive yeah. note. It's yeah. very positive, everything you said. Uh, after I'm going to ask you about eutrophication, Okay. And uh, I'm going yeah. to uh, <laughs> I'm going to uh, also ask you um, how could this um, rebuild idea be more concretized? I, yeah. I understand you need to have a baseline to understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We rebuild. We need to know yeah. what's there now, so that we know yeah. how you add to what's mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So we probably need to choose a year and yeah. get the baseline for a certain year. But uh, I was probably I'm coming to back to you, yeah, good. and I go back to Karen, because I'm also very interested in listening more about your three key issues. Um, of course, one is closer, which is this idea of protecting 30% of the oceans by 2030. Do you think this is going to be feasible at the UN Ocean Conference next year in Lisbon, Karen? Uh, I am a complete optimist, and so yes is the answer, and I, and I think what Carlos has said is so important, because the most exciting thing about the ocean is its incredible ability to regenerate itself. And the best thing that we can do to help the ocean is actually nothing. We need to stop. <laughs> we need to stop some of our activities so that it can regenerate. Um, next year is what we call an ocean super year, 2020. There are so many decisions that have been bubbling below, below the surface for the last 10 years of negotiations. And next year, we'll see a series of those, deci those decisions po decision points. So in terms of meeting the 2030 goal, uh, if we wanted to protect 30% of the ocean, we have got to protect uh, the ocean within country waters, in international waters as well. And there are different legal regimes in place, depending on where you are. We've, we've decided how to divide up the ocean pie so that we can regulate it. So within country waters, countries need to act now. And they need to create protected areas, and the Azores is a, a good example of uh, a place that is taking action. There are numerous countries, from Mexico uh, to uh, Brazil before Bolsonaro, who were uh, protecting huge areas of their waters. The little North Pacific country of Palau has protected 80% of their waters. The US under President Obama 
had got to almost 30%. So countries can do that. They can act within their own waters. And next year in China, there, there will be a meeting of the Convention on Biological Diversity where they will be setting the targets, the legally binding targets for countries uh, for uh, biodiversity protection. And so that's when that decision on 30% will be taken. So we all need to work, and that all need to work means, um, it means corporate uh, engagement uh, for the ocean. The ocean is everybody's business, not just the business of people who extract from it. Um, so we need corporate voices engaged, we need government voices, and we need individual action. We've also got, Tiago, um, the Antarctic Treaty. It's, oh. it's the 200th anniversary of the discovery of Antarctica. And in, in, on the 27th of January uh, of 2020, and uh, the Antarctic Treaty has a legal regime in place. They can actually make decisions now to protect Antarctic waters. And in fact, uh, Secretary Kerry was key to getting government leaders to decide on creating the biggest marine reserves on Earth in the Ross Sea. It's uh, over one million square kilometers. Um, they, the countries that are members of that treaty have been talking about establishing new protected areas since 2009. There are three now on the table. They need to make those decisions by consensus, so they all have to agree. Every country is on board, except for Russia and China. So we all need to work to get that done. If we can protect those three areas, that's 2% of the global ocean protected. And finally, at the United Nations in New York, there have been negotiations about negotiations and now negotiations for a new treaty to protect high seas biodiversity, so yep. to esta establish protected areas in the high seas, and that will be concluding next year. And once that treaty is agreed, countries will be able to establish high seas protected areas. That's half the surface area of the planet. The irony, sorry, to, I'm trying to be very positive, but at the same time next year, the International Seabed Authority, which is the international organization that regulates mining uh, in beyond national jurisdiction, is also planning on finalizing its rules about seabed mining. And it seems insane to me that at the same time as governments are sitting at the UN negotiating about how to protect high seas biodiversity, they then all get on a plane go down to Jamaica and negotiate at the International Seabed Authority about how to destroy that biodiversity. That needs to be stopped. They just, we need to have a moratorium on any kind of seabed mining at least until 2030. Those are the opportunities that we can work towards. Right. And now to you. Very, <laughs> thank you very much for that, Karen. I, um, I, wanted, to, um, I wanted to say that um, uh, of course, um, we should all by now start sending emails to China and Russia on Antarctica. <laughs> we, it's now the key moment. We can do it. Um, if we have these two countries on board, they, uh, we would have um, uh, incredible new MPAs um, in the world, 2%, as mm -hmm. you said. Uh, I'm going to ask you more about business, how to engage business and corporations. And now I wanted to go back to Paul and say, Paul, you spoke about values, so ethics, and I think that this is really something that this um, conference should discuss as well. We should question ourselves on how we are uh, at this situation, and, uh, and so you think, you, I understood, we need to mobilize our societies much more in terms of taking this serious in our education, and so on. You are yourself a born communicator, what, what do you think, how do you think we could concretize more this possibility of shaping people's values uh, in the direction that you think is appropriate? I think the best thing we can do is to, is to set good high standard examples. Because when we talk about sustainability in the future, it's not gonna be us here. It's gonna be the next generation. They'll do it their way and they'll do it brilliantly, I presume, and they'll have their own planet just as we look at our planet, this is our life, it's our intelligence, it's, this is where we live, this is our place. And the next generation will feel exactly the same. But to encourage them to make good decisions, we all need to set absolute high standard examples. For instance, when we look at, at say, transarctic shipping in the Arctic, 
Now we've got something called transarctic shipping. When I was a, when I was a, a young boy and we looked at the Arctic, I was still thinking of Franklin's journeys and the, it was the Holy Grail. Could you possibly get through from the Atlantic through to the Pacific? And now, of course, tourist ships go through there and it's open and there is shipping through the Northwest Passage and across the top of Russia, the northern sea route. And the way it's been approached, I've been attending these transarctic shipping conferences, it's looking good. There's been a lot of smart decisions with double hull ships. There's been a lot of smart legal frameworks. There's been a lot of smart risk assessments and a lot of what feels like very good empathy and understanding with the Inuit population. So I th and I feel, I'm an eternal optimist, just like you, Karen, <laughs> that there is a sense that the way we're looking at transarctic shipping, it's a sensible, sustainable adaptation to climate change. And if we do it right, future generations will look back and say, actually, this group from the Industrial Revolution to today did a terrible job. But then the generation that we are here, this decision making, did a really smart thing the way they brought in transarctic shipping. They really did think about it. And I think that it's that sort of thinking that we need. We're always setting that example. So when we, as I say, when we vote, when we're in board meetings, when we're influencing community leaders that we know are gonna make decisions, that we have a feeling that when we've left that group of people or that individual, that when they next stand up at that board meeting, she's going to go this way instead of the old-fashioned that way. And that's the very best thing we can do, and I think it's the best value well, for energy. Well, yesterday, the president of Azores was at this stage, and he said, of course, that there is always a dilemma between people that think about the end of the world and people yes. that think about the end of the day, of the month. Yes. Um, it's, this is very important. Individual responsibility is very important, and I think that's something that we also discussed already yesterday. But how do you think that works in times of, um, of hardship uh, for people that want to uh, meet? Uh that's a great one, yeah. Th thank you, Tiago. Well, of course, when times are difficult, that's when our true colors are shown. And I think that's a great leadership opportunity. I think when there's a region that is maybe bumping along the bottom economically and bumping along the bottom perhaps in human rights and bumping along the bottom with international debt. So the United there's, States. There's an, yes, yes, <laughs> a developing country. There's, there's a sense that what are you going to do? You say, well, let's, let's just get some, some cheap decisions here some low quality decisions and we'll, we'll sell off some of our assets, we'll sell off our fishing licenses cheap, we'll do anything to get some money to get us through to tomorrow. But what an opportunity for leadership it is when someone says, hang on, we'll, we'll make those smart decisions, we'll go to the Club of Paris, we'll reorganize our international debt, we'll try for a debt for nature swap, we'll try and make smart decisions with science leaders to come in and influence us for the future generations and for smart decisions to get through. There's always an answer. And I would say that when, when a region or a country or a community is bumping along the bottom, mm. but nature is being damaged or human rights are not being uh, 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 run to, then I would say that is the great leadership opportunity. And the future global leaders will pick that up. Great. Oh, to build a new relationship with nature. Um, I wanted, uh, we have uh, organized ourselves as to give the floor to the public uh, a bit earlier than supposed so that we have uh, a larger um, uh, interchange. Mm. But uh, I just wanted uh, for you to keep in mind and with the answers, come up with, uh, uh, with some ideas, if you may, Carlos, on uh, how to build a, a tool that will allow us to um, to rebuild the nature, to rebuild the bio, biomass in the planet? Well, it, it, some of the elements are already in place, the po policy levers are in place, but we need to accelerate the efforts, and we also need to uh, reorganize the investment, because the investment required to rebuild marine life by 2050 is about 10 billion uh, per year, and that's already on the ground, but it's not used effectively. So we need to uh, be able to have a coordinated plan to increase the efficiency of how we use those resources, deploy them uh, wisely, and then also uh, be mindful of the benefits of that because we calculate that the investment, this is an investment, not a cost, because the investors will recover $10 or 10 euros on each euro inve invested. And that's, that will be mostly the seafood industry and the insurance industry. So it's actually not only ethically, uh, uh, e ethically an imperative in terms of ethics, but it's also a very wise business case to rebuild marine life. 
Oh, great. We need a plan. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, I ask you, uh, if you have a plan, do let us know. And we will open now questions to the public. Um, so I'm going to ask the Regie to uh, uh, give us the time. Yep. And uh, who? Ah, OK. You, <laughs> you talked yesterday, right? I have to give it to someone before. I'm sorry about that. There we go. Oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> what do you think? Only halfway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Hi. This one? Okay. How can we, the general public, remain better informed about the key decisions out there and the key decision makers making it? Because I cannot personally believe that there's anybody out there who would make a decision to actively destroy our planet. So I think that the general public is well aware of, of what needs to be done, but how can we understand the pressure that those decision makers are facing in order for them to make the decisions that we find wrong? And how can we oppose that with our own pressure as a civil society to basically push their buttons to get the decisions that we want pulled through? Thank you. Uh, let's go for another one. Uh, there. You can throw it. Uh, my question goes about um, uh, to Carlos on uh, what he was mentioning about uh, the capital benefits of uh, investing on restoring biomass. Um, how can be attracted to those end of the mountain and end of the um, end of the world, the linkage of economy, like the president of Azores mentioned, that only through economy we can boost the change. So I want you to understand better that link between um, biomass restoration and. Uh, Economical growth. Great, very clear question. We have someone here in the front. You have to. <laughs> Never see. Well done. Hi, thank you. So imagine that we have all been deniers here, and I'm sure we have people here from all walks of society. And now, with all the evidence we've heard, we decide from this day onwards, from now, to change, to be agents of change, and to be part of the solution, not of the problem. What can we do as we leave this room to change and to save the planet and to save the oceans? Thank you. Okay, great. I right. think we're going to answer to this first round of questions, right. and then we'll have more <laughs> questions. But the gentleman there, if you can throw him. Thank you. Um, very well. So uh, I would ask Carlos, Karen, and Paul if you wanted to comment on these three questions. I understood the first one is about pressuring political decision makers. The second one is about the link between economics and biomass, rebuilding biomass. And uh, this third one is how can we mobilize and, uh, and act uh, individually um, for, for the best. On the uh, uh, you know, pressurizing and influencing decision makers and political leaders, we can't go wrong with uh, thinking about the free press We've got a strange situation. I mean, you know, I live it in Switzerland and, and in England, um, and I'm English, and, and it turns out that this whole uh, Brexit vote and this whole Brexit decision-making was, was uh, you know, hard to understand how we were all influenced by social media and by <coughs> vast amounts of money coming into the British political system that we're not used to. We're not used to that. Um, in my lifetime, never seen anything like it. And... Um, there's been some terrific, insightful reports on how we were all given uh, very nuanced information, information much, much worse than a normal political debate and a political election about the way um, our proposed European exit would work. And when I look back through all of this, and it reads like something out of an old-fashioned James Bond spy novel, you know, that we're going to have all these people look at social media, we know, we understand how this group of people work. We're going to influence it so that there's a chance of nudging this group this way. And the amount of money and effort that's taken has given me quite an insight as to what's happened in other parts of the world with this um, brilliant tool called social media that we all love and means that we can almost feel that the whole planet is instantly connected to important issues. And realizing that actually there's vast groups that use it against us. And I stupidly and quite naively thought that would never happen. Who would have foreseen that? So I think the free press, the active journalism, and the sense of supporting um, trustworthy news sources and 
political reporting has to be one good first step. Okay. Uh, and Karen, what do you think? Um, what do you think we can do? Uh, yeah. Well, I think first, to stay informed, there's some amazing organizations doing work to keep people informed. You are more than welcome to follow Ocean Unite <laughs> on Twitter. Um, but also, in, in, in Portugal, Seas at Risk is doing fantastic work, um, keeping people informed about what is going on in Portuguese waters in Europe. Seas at Risk. Seas at Risk. I don't know what it is in Portuguese. Mm. Uh, it's No, we use the name Seas at Risk. OK. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund, Greenpeace, there are organizations, follow them, see what is going on, you can learn what is happening. The EU has just appointed for the first time a commissioner on the environment and the ocean. So finally the ocean is, is, is going to be recognized. We need to follow very carefully to make sure that the new commissioner is, uh, will be doing his job correctly. The third, I think the, the other question from in front was about what can we do as individuals, and there's a whole list, but here are three things. Number one, think about your carbon footprint. Shift to renewables wherever you can. Uh, change the way you're acting in terms of your carbon emissions. Number two, think about the plastic that you are using. Try and use as few single-use plastics as you can. Try and shift your kitchen to a single-use, plastic-free environment. When you go into a supermarket, talk to them about how, why they need to encase an avocado or a banana, which already has a skin on it, in a piece of plastic. Put pressure on them that way. And while you're there, if you happen to go past the fish counter, think about the fish that you are buying and consuming. Portug Portugal has a huge fish footprint in terms of how much seafood is consumed here. And there are definitely uh, seafood cards that you can look at to see what is viable for you to eat and what isn't. And I think if you can change your behavior in those three ways, you begin to make an impact in terms of where the planet is going. Great. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Karen. <laughs> Carlos, there is a question for you. <laughs> sure, yes. The links between yeah. economics and biodiversity. Yeah, well, certainly not economics will be the main driver of restoring the oceans. It should be uh, values and not value, right? <laughs> but in addition to the values, then we actually also derive value from restoring the oceans. And uh, right now, the, the percent of the global fisheries that has been managed for sustainability is growing rapidly, also driven by consumer demand. And it is calculated that uh, if we manage to uh, uh, harvest all fish stocks at sustainable levels, the benefit to the seafood industry will be 50 billion per year of added uh, value to the seafood industry. So that's a huge return to the seafood industry of helping uh, manage the fishery sustainable. That, that is just one example. We have also the, uh, developed over the last 30 years the capacity for control food production in the ocean, which is aquaculture, probably the major milestone of the 21st uh, first century, when we look back 200 years now, is not the internet or energy or something. It's about being able to grow food sustainably in the ocean. And agriculture is rapidly uh, moving into a sustainable uh, uh, concept and framework. And it is now providing about half of the seafood consumed globally. Without agriculture, we would not be able to uh, rebuild the ocean. So we need to build agriculture in a sustainable manner that will also deliver benefits, and also if we rebuild the coastal habitats like mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows, we help protect the shoreline for, from uh, floods and other impacts. And for instance, if we look at the tsunami of uh, 2004 in the Indian Ocean, there were a quarter of a million lives lost due to that tsunami. And in the villages where there was a little bit of mangrove patch left, the casualties were almost nil, and also the uh, damages to uh, infrastructure were very little. Mm. So if we protect the shorelines by rebuilding the natural barriers in the ocean, that will also derive benefit in terms of avoided losses. But also these habitats are important nursery sites for global fisheries. So as we rebuild the oceans, the ocean catalyzes growth and catalyzes benefits to humanity. And in terms of that shift of values, I tell my students that I belong to the generation that is responsible for the steep decline of marine life. 
and they belong to the generation that is slowing down and bringing that to a stop. And our grandchildren are the generation that are going to rebuild the oceans, not to any baseline. It's not going to look like the oceans were in 1850 or 1820. But it matters not if it's going to look like it was in the past. What matters is that the future oceans, once rebuilt, will be boiling with life of all sizes from small to large, and it will have the three-dimensional complexity to ensure that marine ecosystems are fully functional and able to deliver the benefits that we all profit from. Very good. Right. good man. Thank you, Carlos. I, I will now give the floor to the gentleman there. I would like to ask if it is possible to save the planet without changing the economy and finance routes and the way how the most powerful countries uh, make their international policy according to their so-called national interests. Okay, anyone else? Uh, on the other side too, uh, there is also someone closer here and then there is that gentleman there. So you choose. Yeah, you chose. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was a great move. Thank you. Uh, I work at a small sustainable financial investment bank. So we invest in projects that have impact in sustainable development in, de in developing countries. That's always an issue uh, on the cost of sustainability. Uh, uh, basically, the argument is sustainability is good for good cooperation, is not good for SMEs. But I'm sure there will be a cost of non-sustainability. Uh, how can we um, incorporate that cost, the cost on health, the cost on destruction uh, on, uh, on uh, shore if we destroy the environment, the cost of substituting uh, fresh water for desinalization? All of that has an economic cost. But we need to know what is that cost so we can incorporate that in risk analysis for sustainable uh, investment and sustainable development. Do we have elements and numbers and figures that show us the cost of non-sustainability versus the cost of sustainability? Thank you. Great. So, to go on. Second question that is related to the first. Can you throw it to the front here? Please. Th can you <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> Just going to see it. Anyway. Um, well, I'm a, a scuba diver, and I understand <laughs> what you meant. Uh, the thing is that my question specifically is changing the values of the politicians, which are elected by so far by the people, and uh, not counting with Cambridge, Cambridge Analytics or uh, Boris Johnson that was elected by these peers or, or chosen by these peers. I found that we had gone back. Yes. I see that the, all of the members of the panel are positive about changing, but are we really changing? Are we really going moving forward to a better world? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Shall we have a, another question still? Uh, so those ladies there. Thank you very much. Wow, good catch. Okay, thank you. I would like also to, um, uh, to add uh, perhaps a fourth uh, a thing that we can do is that uh, uh, get out from our uh, personal um, uh, dif uh, difficult to act in civic movements. Uh, there is also uh, currently a global movement named Parents for Future that is a, a, a movement of adults, uh, parents, grandparents, that are uniting uh, to pressure and to help uh, to change um, individual habits. So uh, besides those three that you mentioned, I, th I think that um, oneself could get out from the comfortable zone and join civic movements. I think with the civic pressure, and to get adults involved like the students are, uh, I think we can uh, change uh, the way of thinking politics and the way of changing the, um, our consumption 
uh, happy. So That's a great comment. Do you have any questions to the panel too? Uh, no, I would like no. to. Just want to make a question. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> great. Thank you for that. Uh, we will now go through this and we'll see if we have more time. So we have here a question of what needs to change in the economics and finance uh, and if the national interests and international politics and so on will allow us to have these changes. We have a question about uh, the costs of unsustainability and how uh, SMEs can uh, be held accountable as well, uh, which is of course connected with the idea of natural capital and the cost benefit analysis. We have another question about um, are we doomed by our political leadership? And we have finally this question on, uh, well, it's not a question, it was basically a comment on, on uh, civic movements uh, rather than probably organize ourselves with other older forms like NGOs. I have a comment on, on your gentleman's question there, just a short yeah. one, um, is that, uh, no, I don't think we can um, move forward with sustainability issues unless the political system and economic system changes. But I don't think it has to change very much. You know, we already know that there's unsustainable subsidies that are keeping the commercial fishing going and are keeping the oil and gas industry going. And once those subsidies begin to become freer and that money becomes more supportive of sustainable energy, you know, solar and wind and tidal and all the rest of it, um, and development of storage systems and better equipment, um, we already can see that that's going to work. So the whole e economic model and opportunities for natural capital, as you say, sir, is going to build in there. So as well as a, 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 a political system that's based on better values, and I think that will come um, at the same time as the practical economic um, support and opportunities for getting rid of some of these harmful subsidies and subsidizing clean energy and other forms of clean industry. I think that's where it's going to come from in a practical sense. Uh, I would like to add to that because if you uh, look at the stock market and finances uh, today, uh, the stock market is uh, giving very uh, thin, thin returns to investors, <laughs> but there's one sector that is this year has given 24% returns to investors, and those are the new technologies for the environment. Yeah. Those are renewable energy, uh, uh, water uh, technologies, so the market already knows that that is the future. And the market is already tuned to what society is going to be uh, requesting and expecting from the future. So there's necessarily no uh, conflict between uh, economics and finances and the type of change that we wish, because the more of us that are committed with this change, the more markets will be reacting to our wishes and our directions. And that's already a reality. So I believe that this, uh, uh, shift in paradigm has already occurred and now it's a matter of capitalizing in this wave of change and making sure that we accelerate it. So we should not be content with sustainable development, we should not be content with the Paris Agreement, we should do better and we can do better. And once we will uh, release all of the new technologies that are going to support this, there will be money to be made, there will be many jobs to uh, be involved in deploying these technologies, uh, developing the technologies, and also restoring the oceans. And I believe that we will have a healthier society, but also one that generates wealth and more opportunities for everyone. Just Karen, uh, allow me just before you, I just wanted to say <laughs> something in comp that complements what you said, Carlos, which is, I think that the <coughs> the, the, um, uh, this new brand of sustainability, which cuts across e every sector, it's the first brand that cuts across every sector of industry. Before we had cars that needed to be reliable, food that needed to be tasty, <laughs> and the clothing that needed to be fashion. Nowadays, the three need to be uh, f sustainable. Uh, and they know that, that we are probably going to, we to, to watch in the next decade a new patholo pat pathology in our societies, which is greenwashing. Mm -hmm. It's going to actually to be the opposite. Everyone is going to try to position their business, their product, their cell to be sustainable, even if it is not. And this we are already witnessing, unfortunately, happening a lot mm. in the world. Sorry, Karen. No, thank <laughs> you, Tiago. I think we absolutely have to change our economic model. We can't continue the way we are. Growth at all costs, it just is not going to work. And that's going to cause disruption, um, which is a challenge. And I think one of the biggest challenges that governments are facing, and potentially part of the reason that we go back with with leaders in the way that they're thinking is because this 
ecological and economic disruption is enabling the politics of fear and the politics of fear of the other. The foreigners who are coming in to take our jobs, the environmentalists who are closing down our factories. And so that is a key part of the thinking that needs to come into government decision making. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing that's starting to happen, as I think everyone else here has started talking about, is actually the engagement of the finance sector and the insurance sector. And we have a, a project that we're working on with AXA and a number of other insurers. Um, th they are, th their modeling is clearly showing we are on a pathway to a four degree world. If you go to an insurance or finance meeting, the CEOs are not talking about maybe we should you know, fiddle around the edges. They are talking about their very real exposure to very real risks and how they need to address those. And so learning and working with the finance and insurance sector to model that change so that we can begin to show policymakers what is coming in the future so that they can actually begin to show us as voters that engaging now to change our behavior, to change the way we do things, is actually going to be more cost effective than waiting until 10 years from now and seeing the real true costs of harm for that. So that's the second piece. The third piece goes into the social movements and, uh, and what we need to do. Um, so Tiago said, uh, I'm from South Africa originally. Uh, you can all see I'm a white South African. I grew up under apartheid and was the beneficiary of all of the privileges that apartheid could provide. And then I realized that there was something, you know, children are, are brought up not necessarily realizing what's going on, then you realize and, and things needed to change. And in the late 1980s, um, I was active a small part in the anti-apartheid struggle as many people were. None of us thought that we would we would end apartheid. Uh, in 1991, in 1990, the country was under a state of emergency. People were being killed by death squads. The economy was in ruins. There was a, a big international movement against it. Um, academia, culture, sports, economists, politicians, people on the ground banded together to fight against apartheid. And Nelson Mandela was released from prison. And there's a quote that is often heard where he said, it always seems impossible until it's done. Yeah. And that's, I think, part of what we have to do. The second quote I'm gonna throw at you on this is from President Obama, who said, sometimes you just have to do up your bootstraps and get organizing. So it always seems impossible until it's done. Do up your bootstraps and get organizing, which is what we all have to do. And the third quote is from somebody who I have the privilege of working with on a regular basis, Sir Richard Branson, who is very well known for his quote, which is, uh, screw it, let's do it. <laughs> That's what very we good. need to do. <laughs> and, um, thank you, Karen. Very inspiring. Yeah. Carlos, you have yeah. a final say. Yeah. We are going to wrap up in a few moments, but uh, you have yeah. a final say. But I'd like to pick on uh, Karen's uh, statement about the politics of fear, because the politics of fear are played by many camps, including the environmentalist movement. And to some extent, uh, it actually deceives the purpose. And I would like to correct a few numbers that I often misquoted and used widely that has no, no empirical evidence, no scientific evidence. There's going to be no more plastic than fish by 2050. Never, ever. That number comes from the blue. It's not scientifically based. There's going to be not an ocean full of jellyfish. That is simply not happening. It's not there. There is not an island of plastic in the North Pacific. That is not true. It's not facts. And the oxygen is uh, the ocean is losing oxygen. That's correct, but it's losing oxygen very, very slowly. So it will take 3,000 years before that loss in oxygen has any measurable impact on the biology. So let's move away from the fear. Let's realize that in fact we're moving to a better world, and there's many evidences that we're moving to a better world. And let's go and do it. Very well. I think that we have reached the end of our time. <laughs> I'm going to wrap up on uh, just a second. <laughs> still just wrap up. Uh, I think that uh, we can conclude that um, 
we need to ch we need to uh, we need to stick to values, uh, and we need to use education uh, to reinforce those values, and we need to remain optimistic. <laughs> um, I think that uh, we understand that the situation, although uh, in some terms can be uh, augmented, it's it's a problematic uh, situation. It's a crisis situation in terms of the sustainability. We lost half of the biodiversity in the last 50 years, mm -hmm. a biodiversity natural na nature biodiversity. Uh, the good news is that the ocean, uh, uh, it's, uh, our, it's a resilient system and there is a way to, uh, to work from there and, uh, and we can rebuild part of that loss. Uh, and also what Karen says is that we can concretize this rebuilding by declaring that we need to protect 30% by 2030. I, I'm going to uh, say one thing, is that uh, from my end, uh, uh, the oceans were not on top in the last two decades. I've been a player in ocean politics for 20 years, and I know it. We need to put the oceans on top, and we need to use the decade that now starts for that. In order to do that, Portugal has a responsibility here. Portugal not only has a lot of the ocean of the Northeast Atlantic Ocean, but as Karen said as well, we have a track record on fish consumption that increases our responsibility. So, what I'm saying is that we are going to be co-organizers with Kenya next year of the UN Ocean Conference 2020. I hope that we can all influence uh, the Portuguese government uh, and, uh, and, um, and the Kenyan governments so that we have the most meaningful result out of 2020. This is a goal for the international agenda that is rather concrete. I think that probably it should come out from this meeting, and this is a wish, that we would have in the next three years a meeting for heads of state and government only focused on oceans, as we had it for Paris in 2015. And with this wish, I conclude this session. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.